The St. Louis Area Food Bank presents the Illinois CSFP Annual Compliance Course. Welcome. The Commodity Supplemental Food Program, or CSFP, supplements nutritional need by providing USDA food to low-income neighbors aged 60 and up. CSFP is a federal program, but administration varies from state to state. The Illinois Department of Human Services and the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services run things differently. That's why we offer two CSFP courses. If you distribute senior boxes in Illinois, you're in the right course. We're glad you're here. IDHS requires all staff and volunteers who distribute senior boxes in Illinois to complete annual USDA training courses. We recommend that staff and volunteers begin their training by completing the civil rights course, we're all expected to be familiar with civil rights. Then, staff or volunteers who take the greatest responsibility for the senior box program should complete this course next. Program tasks vary quite a bit. For someone distributing boxes who never touches paperwork, details about taking neighbors through the application process aren't very relevant. For those of you taking on the greatest responsibility, it's okay to shorten the training for others. Let them know what parts they can skip. You may wonder, why does the USDA require us to take these courses every year? Their intention is to remind us of why we take extra care when serving USDA food, we want to provide equitable access to safe food for neighbors in need. Volunteers and staff may alter or drop required practices if they're unaware of why we do them. McGill notices Steve shoving a storage rack tightly against the wall. Steve says, every night when Blue cleans they pull out this rack and never put it back right, it's a pain when I unload the delivery. McGill replies, did you know Blue's following a food safety rule to prevent pest problems? Training gets everyone together on what to do and why we do it. The rules that guide the program are determined at the national level by the USDA's Food and Nutrition Service, the FNS. They secure the funding, provide the inventory, and regulate the program. The data the USDA collects informs them of nutritional needs and population changes. Data drives decisions about the kinds of food the FNS provides and how much they'll distribute. Usually there aren't significant changes in program regulations from year to year. IDHS reviews and updates CSFP income eligibility around February each year, and sometimes that's the only change in CSFP. Rapid changes have taken place at the USDA and at IDHS in the 2020s. Updates to official posters, forms, manuals, and training may only happen once a year, and often fall behind. Please, pay very close attention to communication from the food bank, and to version dates on all printed and digital documents. Don't hesitate to ask your partner relationship coordinators about the most up-to-date information and resources. As of 2024, CSFP partners take two courses, this course, and a civil rights course, to complete annual compliance training. The FNS provides a yearly allocation of USDA food for CSFP in all 50 states, Puerto Rico, and Washington, D.C. They determine how much food Illinois will receive in proportion to the need. IDHS divides the food for Illinois among participating food banks. St. Louis Area Food Bank receives a yearly allocation in proportion to the need in 12 Illinois counties. The food allocation for CSFP partners is delivered by pallet, and volunteers pack the food into boxes. To make sure the senior box program is managed well, IDHS inspects all Illinois food banks. They check the St. Louis area food bank's warehouse facilities and records as a matter of routine. The FNS directs what the food banks pack. The boxes provide food with vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium, and iron, because these essential nutrients are often lacking in the diets of low-income seniors. There'll always be grains like cereal, rice, and pasta. Canned goods include beans, 
vegetables, juice, and fruits. Proteins vary, but include items like canned meat, shelf-stable milk, or jars of peanut butter, and usually a package of cheese. Each box weighs between 35 to 40 pounds. The St. Louis Area Food Bank prints an informational flyer that volunteers add to each box. The boxes are stored at the warehouse until they can be delivered or picked up. Meanwhile, the St. Louis Area Food Bank monitors distribution, provides support and training, and locates new partners to participate in the program. That brings us to you, our Illinois CSFP partners. Illinois relies on you to find neighbors in need and manage relationships with them. Like the food banks, partners also store boxes until they can be delivered or picked up. Partners certify neighbors as first-time recipients, recertify long-term program participants, and document neighbors transferring locations or departing the program. IDHS publishes program rules in their CSFP policy and procedure manual. The manual contains instructions and forms. Because policy language isn't always easy to follow, we'll explain program standards and expectations in plain terms. Our topics today will be Serving neighbors Certification life cycle Site inspections and caseload management We'll link you to a course completion form where you can indicate if you took the entire course or specific topics only. The course page will also link you to the CSFP manual and other resources you'll need. As always, your partner relationship coordinator welcomes your questions. Let's get started. Serving Neighbors In this section, we'll review receiving, storing, and transporting food safely. We'll talk about invoices and neighbor sign-in but this section doesn't cover the details of paperwork or caseload management. Partners can come to the food bank to pick up senior boxes, but for Illinois partners, that's a long drive. Instead, most Illinois partners set up monthly delivery. Delivery occurs on the same day each month between 7 a.m. and 2 p.m. If this arrangement is not working out well, please contact your partner relationship coordinator to make adjustments. Delivery times cannot be guaranteed, but the food bank can try to narrow the delivery to mornings or afternoons or change your delivery day. For those choosing pickup, pickup days are Monday through Friday. There's easy access parking reserved in front for partners, just off the main driveway. For more specifics about how this works, Contact your partner relationship coordinator. Heartshaped World is a fictional partner based on the St. Louis area food bank's experienced CSFP partners. Invoices document the handoff from the food bank to partners. The box count should match the quantity on the invoice. You should see two invoices arrive with the boxes. Partners keep one for their own records and sign the other for the food bank's files. The St. Louis Area Food Bank works hard to ensure food reaches partners in good condition. Signing the invoice transfers responsibility for food condition to partners. Before signing, check, do the boxes look okay? Get in touch with the food bank immediately if you suspect pest activity or product damage at receiving. To meet USDA regulations, IDHS requires CSFP partners to have at least one volunteer or staff person certified in food safety. The St. Louis Area Food Bank offers SurfSafe's course, Food Handler, training for food banking, free to all volunteers and staff. Combined, the course and certification exam take about two hours to complete. Some volunteers may have food safety certificates of other types or from other companies. These certifications are often more in-depth than food handler certifications, so if you have a current one, you may use it instead. Keeping food secure from damage, pests, and theft is worth the effort. CSFP replacement costs are high. Stand dry storage shelves four or more inches away from walls to prevent pests from nesting in corners. 
Adjust the lowest shelf to 6 or more inches above the floor for sweeping and mopping underneath. If you don't have shelving, request a pallet from the St. Louis Area Food Bank to keep boxes up off the floor to prevent damage in case of spilled mop water or minor flooding. To avoid contamination, keep senior boxes separate from non-food items. Keep cleaning or maintenance products in a different room or on a separate rack. If space is tight, keep non-food items on a lower shelf than food. Well-organized storage is not overcrowded. In dry storage, maintain at least two feet of clearance above boxes on the top shelf to prevent overheating. Boxes should not be stored in direct sunlight. Air circulation is also important to maintaining the correct temperature evenly throughout a cooler. To detect issues, log the cooler temperature routinely. File temperature logs with other program paperwork. Heart-shaped world discovered some spoiled food in their cooler. Was their cooler too warm? Too crowded? Did you know that the packaged cheese that comes with senior boxes isn't shelf-stable dairy? It's a common misunderstanding nationally. Cheese arrives refrigerated from the manufacturer, and food banks maintain refrigeration through delivery to partners. Refrigerate cheese at 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, keep cheese cool when making deliveries to neighbors. To improve airflow, staff replaced a missing shelf and spaced the food packages a little apart. With a new thermometer, the temperature is easy to check and log. Mold, bulging cans, or a nasty smell are warning signs that food has spoiled. Appearances aren't everything though. Some food looks and smells like it's in fine condition but turns out to be part of a contaminated or mishandled shipment from the farm or production plant. When that happens, the USDA will issue a food recall. A food recall attempts to halt the distribution of unsafe food before it reaches the public. IDHS informs all Illinois food banks when a food recall impacts CSFP. The St. Louis Area Food Bank will contact partners to explain the recall and any follow-up actions will need to take. Senior boxes don't have an expiration date on them. The food inside has all different expiration dates. Ideally, all boxes get distributed every month, but if there is a box left over, be sure to have a system in place to keep track of how long it's been in storage. Shauna has one box left from the previous month's delivery when the new delivery arrives. She tags the leftover box to respect a basic food safety rule, first in, first out, or FIFO. When her first neighbor arrives that day, she pulls the oldest box from the shelf. Next, Shauna opens the cooler. She checks the dates on each package. One package from last month's delivery is due to expire in July of next year. The ones from the most recent delivery are due to expire in June of next year. This time, Shauna leaves behind the product that was delivered first. Instead, she selects one of the newly delivered packages that will expire in June. She's following a related, but different food safety rule, first expired, first out, or FIFO. The FIFO and FIFO rules prevent food from aging in storage. Leaving food on a porch during a hot summer's day won't keep the cheese cold or prevent a hungry pest from enjoying a snack. Partner's responsibility for CSFP ends when the food is securely in the neighbor's hands. The same security and food safety rules for storing senior boxes on site also apply to transportation and to drop-off locations. For those of you who are providing delivery service, thank you. You're solving a problem for neighbors who need a helping hand. Certification Life Cycle IDHS asks that each approved site distributing CSFP boxes identifies a site manager or the primary contact for the program. The responsibilities of site management could be shared among several trained staff members or volunteers. Whatever titles they may be known by, the staff and volunteers who take responsibility for verifying and safeguarding neighbor information are required to take this section of the course. Others may skip this section. When you document your course completion, just check off the topics you completed. 
This will satisfy an IDHS training requirement to record the specific topics you learned about. Thank you. Imagine this scenario. Gavin lives on a fixed income. He recently learned senior boxes might help his budget cover other essential needs. He locates a CSFP partner in his county and learns over the phone what he needs to do to apply. He collects some ID and arrives at Heart-Shaped World during their open hours. Shauna, a trained certifying volunteer, has already checked that caseload is available. She seats Gavin at a table, and they complete a CSFP application together. Shauna makes sure the application is filled out completely. She carefully checks Gavin's documents. Before Gavin signs his name, she reviews the rules, rights, and benefits Gavin is signing for. Within 15 minutes of his arrival, Shauna certifies Gavin's application. Gavin begins receiving boxes that same month. Thanks to Shauna's diligence, Heart-Shaped World has good, clear records on file certifying Gavin's eligibility for CSFP. Let's walk through managing the certification life cycle from the first contact with a neighbor through three years of certification. Checking caseload capacity actually means checking two different caseload capacities, your own and the St. Louis area food banks. Caseload at Heart-Shaped World is limited to a maximum of 50 senior boxes each month. They don't have storage space for more. Shauna knows her caseload is well below 50. They've never reached capacity. The St. Louis area food bank has a regional caseload capacity. She just needs to check that they're able to supply her with another box. The USDA and IDHS set the St. Louis area food bank's caseload capacity. This regional limit goes up and down, depending on how much food the USDA has to distribute. Allocations also shift based on changing populations across the nation and within the state. If either the food bank or a CSFP partner hits their maximum caseload capacity, IDHS policy says partners must add qualified applicants to a waitlist. The rules state that the waitlist is kept in order by qualification date. The first neighbor on the list has the right, when caseload is next available, to begin full participation or one-month certification. We'll explain more about that later. If a certified neighbor leaves your service area, their eligibility can be transferred using the transfer form shown here. As they arrive in their new location, caseload is assessed again. If they transfer to another Illinois partner at capacity, IDHS says they must be placed at the top of the waitlist because they're an active certified Illinois recipient. For more details about waitlists and transfers, including this form, refer to the CSFP manual. We'll come back to the topic of waitlisting neighbors when we talk about caseload management. When Gavin called Heart-Shaped World, Shauna consulted current income guidelines from IDHS. Gavin lives alone and earns $15,000 a year before taxes or any other deductions. On the chart, Shauna looked up the program limit on annual income for a household size of one. Gavin's stated income is below the current limit, so he's income eligible for CSFP. We're prohibited from verifying income. IDHS prohibits CSFP partners from asking neighbors for their social security numbers, pay stubs, or other income data. To qualify for senior boxes, income-eligible neighbors need to be age 60 or older and live within a CSFP service area. I live just outside of town, says Gavin, and I'm over 75. Do I qualify for help? Based on what you've told me, I think you do. We should fill out an application together. Shauna asks Gavin to gather some documents to prove his identity, age, and address. We're required to verify identity, birth date, and address. Partners usually review a driver's license or state ID card. If your neighbors have questions about what they can bring, refer to the full list of acceptable documents in the CSFP manual. Does this application form look familiar? If the form you're using looks different, check the date. Your version should be no older than 2022. When forms are updated, 
the St. Louis Area Food Bank will update the links on the course page. Updates to the course may lag behind these changes. Shauna welcomes Gavin, and they sit down together to complete his CSFP application. Gavin states that he lives alone. Shauna checks no in the upper right corner and writes down one for household size. The USDA requires neighbors to enter an address. IDHS recommends unhoused neighbors enter a shelter address they might use. Get in touch with your partner relationship coordinator to explore options. Neighbors check the box in the upper left corner to attest they're not getting a senior box some other way. It can't be left blank. Checking yes will disqualify the applicant for dual participation, a program violation. Pause before checking yes. Let neighbors know it's okay to make changes. Instead of completing the application, they may want a transfer form if they choose to switch providers. Neighbors may continue completing a disqualifying application if they want to. A neighbor may need written notice of disqualification to gain eligibility in a different program somewhere else. The income chart shows annual, monthly, and weekly amounts. Isaac is under the annual limit, but he worries because he's over the current monthly amount. Shauna asks Gavin how much he made last month. $1,850. My kids gave me money. It was a gift. Will this disqualify me? He points to the monthly threshold of $1,632 on the income chart. This is your income before any deductions, right? Shauna reads the instructions and shows Gavin his total annual income divided by 12. You still qualify by average monthly income. Neighbors can provide weekly, monthly, or annual income numbers. Whatever is easiest for them. Partners may convert to average monthly income to demonstrate that neighbors with irregular income still qualify. When Gavin is satisfied with her math, Shauna reads out the paragraph under Changes Must Be Reported. Just let us know if you add more people to your household or if your household income changes. Reading the small print out loud may be helpful for anyone with low vision. This practice is generally recommended and is especially important for communicating the signature section coming up. The USDA collects race and ethnicity data from neighbor intake to compare with local demographic data. While we must ask program applicants for this information, neighbors don't have to provide it. This section may remain blank. In April, CSFP program managers, like you, review and compile the annual total of racial and ethnic data for the USDA. The USDA process doesn't allow for missing data. If you're unsure how to proceed when neighbors decline to provide their race and ethnicity, contact your partner relationship coordinator right away to discuss your options. Some seniors can't lift their box. They may have helpers who collect their box and deliver it. Helpers, or proxies, should be over 18 and have their name on file in the application. Neighbors may change their proxy anytime. Partners who provide delivery service should contact their partner relationship coordinator to make sure the proxy section is set up properly. The signature section is a good time to explain your pickup, delivery, and no-show policies. Then, read the entire signature section out loud. Neighbors check, yes, to acknowledge their rights, the benefits they're signing up for, and the responsibilities they're committing to. Both the neighbor's signature and the date are required. IDHS reinstated the signature requirement they suspended during COVID times. Shauna hands Gavin a program outreach flyer. He hands it back, saying, thanks anyway, I know about these. Offering this flyer fulfills a CSFP contract responsibility to conduct outreach for related government programs. IDHS wants communication back from site managers about neighbor response to outreach. We'll get to that part of the application soon. The agency staff section must be fully completed before the neighbor gets their first box. Warning, 
IDHS wants more information than the form asks for. After verifying identity and age and recording the type of ID, repeat the same process for address. Write in the type of ID underneath the checkboxes. Shauna verifies Gavin's identity and age using his state ID. Under Age Verified, she checks Picture ID card. Next, Shauna verifies Gavin's address using the same ID. Under Address Verified, she checks Yes and writes State ID. Shauna marks Gavin's eligibility, caseload availability, and the result of her outreach. She takes most of the responsibility for neighbor paperwork, so when she signs her name, she uses the title Site Manager. Mark all five checkboxes in the agency staff area. Use this step to help catch anything missed earlier in the process. Don't skip these steps and check the boxes, or leave the boxes blank. The title of the certifying official can be as informal and simple as, volunteer, but it shouldn't be left blank. Be sure to provide your signature as well. Gavin is clearly eligible for CSFP. Before letting Gavin know the happy news, Shauna reviews his application, double-checking items that are often overlooked. Review the neighbor checkboxes, one on each page. These checkboxes are tiny and neighbors frequently miss them. Next, check, did the neighbor supply an address? Did the neighbor write in their birth date? Is the income section filled in completely? Are all signatures and dates present? And, is there a document description written under address verification? None of these areas should be left blank. Shauna dates both the certification and written notice. Gavin, you're good to go. Your first box will arrive this month. Your certification lasts three years. We verify your information once a year. Just let me know if anything in your situation changes. Shauna provided verbal notice. When an application is certified, written notice is optional because most CSFP neighbors don't need it. Shauna dated her verbal notice in the written notice field. The date is required to demonstrate notice was given. Written notice is mandatory when a neighbor is waitlisted or denied. Some partners provide written notice for each qualified applicant. The Notice of Eligibility Determination and Certification Status Form, shown here, covers all three outcomes. 1. Neighbor is eligible. Written notice optional. 2. Neighbor is waitlisted. Written notice required. 3. Neighbor is not eligible. Written notice required. There are only three reasons for ineligibility. Select either income above guideline for household size, age less than 60 years old, or resides in a county that is not within the service area. Partners may also use written notice to communicate certification changes. Use this part to communicate a waitlist change. Invite a waitlisted neighbor to certify for full participation. This part communicates certification expiration. Inform a neighbor in advance when their certification will expire and invite them to get in touch for next steps. Written notice is optional for these certification changes. Shauna needs to complete second and third year verification before Gavin's certification anniversary date. She'll check that Gavin still lives within the service area and qualifies by household size and income. Sometime in the month ahead of a neighbor's certification anniversary, review the address, income, and household size written on the application form with your neighbor. The monthly sign-in sheet should demonstrate that only active neighbors and proxies with certified paperwork on file are picking up senior boxes. Partner relationship coordinators recommend pre-filling the names of each active neighbor on the sign-in sheet for the coming month. As you check each application on file, review who's due for their annual verification, whose certification is expiring, and who was at no-show the previous month. Then, when neighbors get their boxes, 
have them sign and date next to their name on the sheet. This way, partners can easily see who was a no-show at the end of the month. The Notice of Adverse Action, shown here, provides written confirmation when a neighbor is discontinued or disqualified. Disqualifying a neighbor should be avoided, if possible. Common reasons for using this form include. Neighbor voluntarily departs the program, discontinued. Neighbor participant has been a no-show for two consecutive months, discontinued. Neighbor participant was mistakenly certified, disqualified after certification. Neighbor applicant checked, yes, to dual participation, disqualified before certification. The adverse action form should show two dates at least 15 days apart. The effective date when participation ends should be more than two weeks in the future from the notification date. The right to a fair hearing gives disqualified neighbors a means to contest an adverse action while continuing to receive benefits, if they're receiving them already. When disqualifying a neighbor, provide the fair hearing form together with the adverse action notice to give neighbors the maximum amount of time to respond. When discontinuing a neighbor, no fair hearing notice is necessary. Disqualifying adverse actions may not come up very often. The CSFP manual explains the rules and includes the form. Intake forms contain sensitive data about our neighbors. Although we're prohibited now from collecting social security numbers, in the past we were required to. That means that in older records we may still have social security numbers to safeguard against exposure or theft. All program documents should be kept on site for four years, three full past years and the current year. Make a copy of each form you provide to a neighbor to keep on file. If you have any questions about protecting data or how to keep documents organized, please reach out to your partner relationship coordinator. Administering the Senior Box program demands organized paperwork. A free software program from Feeding America is being configured to help. Watch for news coming from the Food Bank about service insights on MealConnect. Certification is the final step of a successful application process for eligible neighbors, beginning a three-year life cycle. Certification effectively puts an owner's name on a senior box for the next 12 months, which they are responsible to collect. Partners track neighbors, completing annual verification. At the end of three years, neighbors and partners fill in a new application to continue the program. We know certification doesn't always go smoothly. Your partner relationship coordinator is available to answer your questions from paperwork basics to how to handle tricky situations. The best advice they can give you will be tailored for your unique situation, and they look forward to helping you. Site Inspections The CSFP manual contains a copy of the State Inspection Checklist. In this section, we'll talk about some of the items on this checklist, including documents site inspectors will review. To prepare partners for site inspections, partner relationship coordinators conduct a network status review yearly. They also provide general onboarding training and refresher training for site managers, staff, and volunteers. To receive CSFP food, each site signs a contract that gives the St. Louis Area Food Bank, IDHS, and USDA inspectors the authority to conduct unannounced inspections. Site inspectors will have identification to show they are who they say they are. Please let all staff and volunteers know it's okay to let these inspectors in. Food Bank Partner relationship coordinators visit network partners routinely. Their goal is to provide program support. Health Department The local health department is mainly concerned with food safety in the community. They check that local codes are satisfied. State. IDHS reviews USDA program compliance at Illinois sites. Federal. The USDA reviews USDA program compliance at any site where a USDA program is in place. Here's a summary of the most important CSFP documents. 
partner CSFP contract with the St. Louis Area Food Bank. Neighbor applications and associated forms. Neighbor and proxy sign-in sheets for each month. CSFP invoice for each month. Temperature and pest control logs, food safety certificates, most recent health inspection report. Flyers and other materials that mention the USDA or CSFP, and training documentation. Site inspectors expect that all documentation, digital or paper, is stored and accessible on site. Inspectors check documents from the current year and three previous calendar years. To save space, it's okay to discard outdated records. If the current year is 2024, all records dated 2020 and older can go. All records dated 2021 onward should be available for review. One commonly mislaid document is the CSFP Partner Agreement. If you're missing a signed, dated copy on site while operating CSFP distributions, it's a little like losing track of your driver's license. If you want to keep on driving you get it replaced as fast as you can. Reach out to the St. Louis Area Food Bank to replace a missing partner agreement, it's like a license to distribute CSFP food, and all site inspectors want to see that. In the certification section, we mentioned that partners have 10 days to respond to a neighbor application. Site inspectors check on our compliance with this rule. They compare the date the neighbor signed the application with the date the partner gave written notice. The dates should demonstrate that the neighbor was informed of a decision within 10 days. Food recalls don't happen very often. When they do, partners need to research neighbor records to identify seniors who could have received recalled food. Organized record keeping is critical for partners to be able to respond quickly particularly for Class 1 recalls because they're potentially life-threatening. Invoices include information such as delivery dates that help track recalled food or any other quality issues. Because they're related to food safety, site inspectors will look to see if they're systematically retained and stored where volunteers and staff can easily access them. For example, they may be stored in chronological order in a binder or a filing cabinet. Site inspectors check temperature and pest control logs. IDHS does not provide forms for logging, leaving it up to partners to create their own logs. The St. Louis Area Food Bank provides a temperature log for partners. Some partners use this form already. New in 2024, the Food Bank created a pest control log for partners. If you aren't using one already, this log may help you get started. The SurfSafe Food Handler certification lasts three years. The certification date is on the certificate, but the expiration date isn't. Be sure to contact your partner relationship coordinator if you need help getting certified or checking on expiration. Some volunteers may have food safety certificates of other types or from other companies. Contact your coordinator to get copies of these certifications on file. This works both ways. Like the food bank, partners must also keep food safety certificates on file. If you're missing certificates, you can request copies from your coordinator. Site inspectors check to see if food containers, shelves, and floors have been wiped clean of food spills. Food storage areas should be well lit. Inspectors are likely to ask to review all health department inspection reports. Some health departments are reactive, conducting inspections only when investigating a complaint. Partners under reactive departments may never have such a report. Other health departments are proactive, conducting site inspections routinely. If you have any health inspection reports, file them as you would other important CSFP records. Site inspectors check to see if required program posters are displayed where neighbors can easily see them during program hours. There are two that all CSFP sites display. The first poster is titled, And Justice for All. We talk about this poster in civil rights training. It's provided by the USDA, 
and the contents are the USDA's non-discrimination statement. The second poster is titled, Participant No-Show Policy. This poster helps partners meet public notification requirements outlined in the IDHS CSFP manual. There's a third poster that only some sites need to display. By law, CSFP partners at sites where religious activities like worship, instruction, or proselytizing take place must offer USDA food distribution in a separate space or at a separate time. To make it clear that neighbors can participate in religious activities if they wish, but not as a condition to receive food, IDHS provides the Notice of Beneficiary Rights Flyer for religious organizations to hand to neighbors during the application process, delivery, and pickup. This flyer should be displayed as a poster at CSFP sites where religious activities take place, to inform neighbors of their rights in writing before they participate in CSFP. By law, neighbors who object to the religious character of a site distributing CSFP food should be referred to other sites so they can continue to participate in the program. In the past, partners made referral information available on request. Now all neighbors receive referral information. Per the USDA, IDHS withdrew their poster, flyer, and referral requirements in September 2023. In July 2024, the USDA released updated requirements. Accordingly, IDHS updated their flyer with new referral information. Please, post and share the updated flyer. All print and digital materials that mention CSFP or USDA food must contain the USDA's non-discrimination statement. For example, the St. Louis Area Food Bank describes CSFP on their website to educate the public about senior boxes. Below the program description is the full non-discrimination statement. Web pages have space for additional words, but social media posts or printed flyers may not. If there isn't enough room, at a minimum we should include a short statement, such as, this institution is an equal opportunity provider. Partners see this short statement on the title screen of this course. Neighbors see it on the monthly CSFP newsletter the St. Louis Area Food Bank includes inside each senior box. CSFP News usually contains a recipe and a short explanation of the nutritional benefits that come from eating various foods. To promote mental acuity and provide a bit of fun, there's a puzzle or a game. The newsletter shown here also has some outreach about other programs seniors may qualify for. Site inspectors may ask if partners provide any education on site in addition to this newsletter. If you do, be prepared to share your materials. Training records have changed over the years. Right now, there's no need to capture signatures or use an IDHS form. If you train staff or volunteers to meet government regulations, record the name of the training, the names of each attending person, and the date the training took place. IDHS asks that CSFP partners record the topics they covered for CSFP training because the content can be customized or shortened. In addition to reviewing training attendance records, site inspectors may also ask to see any training materials you use, such as a PowerPoint, printed document, or online link. The request covers the nutrition education we mentioned earlier. Refer to the CSFP manual to see a copy of the IDHS site inspection checklist. Contact your coordinator with any questions you may have about site inspection. Caseload Management In this section, we'll review the basics about managing caseload and related paperwork. The top priority is communication. The goal is getting boxes to all qualified seniors, but also to avoid having unclaimed boxes piling up and aging in storage, a common pitfall with this program. We'll use our fictional partner, Heart-Shaped World, to provide a basic example of how partners can rebalance senior box inventory after neighbors make unannounced changes. Heart-Shaped World received 46 boxes in early December. By the middle of the month, three boxes hadn't been collected. Shauna, the site manager, called Allison, 
Tom's proxy to find out what was going on. I don't know what to tell you, Allison said. Tom went into the hospital late in November, and he isn't home yet. How long can you hold his box? Shauna explained that Tom was eligible to receive his December box as long as he got home for at least one day of the month. What happens if he doesn't come home until January? Let's just take this one day at a time for now. I want to keep Tom in the program as long as I can. Keep in touch. Dee had been regularly picking up her box each month, then stopped after October's pickup. Shauna called Dee several times in November and December, but no one picked up her calls or returned her messages. Until Shauna could determine if Dee had been home in November, Shauna wanted to continue holding her box. Meanwhile, December's delivery arrived, including another box for Dee. Shauna visited Dee's address and learned from a family member there that Dee had unexpectedly moved into a nursing home at the end of October. Shauna connected with Dee, who voluntarily ended her participation in the program. Dee's participant status changed from active to inactive in October. Now Shauna can change heart-shaped world's caseload and release her hold on Dee's boxes. Tom's status remains active. Shauna made good decisions. IDHS rules take neighbors like Tom and Dee into consideration. Life changes can upset communication and have unpredictable outcomes. That's okay. But to manage caseload, Shauna needs a plan for handling leftover boxes. Eligibility rules mean Dee's unclaimed boxes can't go to her family or to food pantry neighbors. Extra boxes go to waitlisted neighbors because they're already CSFP qualified. Partners at Caseload Capacity keep a waitlist for neighbors who'd like to join their senior box program when caseload count drops below their capacity limit. Heart Shaped World has a capacity of 50 neighbors, which they've never reached. How would they start a waitlist? When neighbors don't participate for two months, no shows, IDHS says to end their benefits. These neighbors aren't disqualified, the monthly routine just didn't work out well for them. When they're discontinued, they may be interested in joining a waitlist. Partners call waitlisted neighbors in the order they joined the waitlist. A neighbor who agrees to collect a leftover box check marks waitlist on the sign-in sheet to activate their one-month certification under Illinois' policy. In the past, Lee had trouble getting through his boxes every month and became a no-show. Shauna suggested one-month certification. There's no obligation, but also no guarantee that there'd be a box for Lee when he most needed one. Lee is now at the top of Shauna's waitlist, so she called him first. Lee picked up Shauna's call and said he'd be glad to collect a box. When Lee arrived, Shauna asked him if he'd like to move off the waitlist and return to the program full-time. Lee shook his head. I just don't need much. No one else on Shauna's waitlist responded to her calls. December ended with two leftover boxes, one extra and one held for Tom. Allison called Shauna with an update as soon as Heart Shaped World reopened in January. Tom's doing better. He was released on December 29th. Can I pick up a box for him today? Allison arrives right away and collects Tom's December box, but says she'll wait to collect his January box until later in the month. Tracking changes, Heart Shaped World's actual caseload dropped from 46 to 45 for November and December but deliveries continued at 46 boxes each month, resulting in two extra boxes. Lee's one-month December certification took care of one extra box. In January, Lee declines one-month certification, and again Shauna gets no positive response from her other waitlisted neighbors. It's time to communicate with the St. Louis Area Food Bank and rebalance the inventory. Before Shauna can contact the food bank, a new neighbor, Gavin, arrives to apply. Shauna quickly certifies Gavin to begin the program in January. As Gavin is the first January neighbor to arrive, he collects the extra December box, emptying the shelves. Shauna contacts her coordinator about Dee's departure from the program and Gavin's new certification. 
Her caseload remains unchanged at 46, but Gavin's January box doesn't need to be included in the upcoming delivery. Shauna works out a one-time delivery reduction with the St. Louis Area Food Bank to balance her inventory, preventing boxes from piling up and aging in storage. Real-world caseload management can be more complicated than our heart-shaped world example. Watch for danger signs. If you experience any of these situations, ask your coordinator for help. Boxes are aging in storage, so that some are more than two or three months old. Boxes overflow dedicated food storage areas and pile up in unsafe or unsecured spaces. Serving neighbors changes from tracking neighbors individually to stocking a fixed amount, distributing boxes first come, first served. This practice is not allowed, ask for help now. No senior should be told they've arrived too late in the month to get their box. Shauna managed caseload in several ways. She rotated her boxes, following first-in, first-out rules. She based her monthly caseload on each neighbor's known participation individually, then followed up quickly and persistently with no-show neighbors. She tracked and updated ownership of each box. She cleared her extra boxes using one-month certification and reduced delivery. She communicated her caseload updates and delivery requests to the food bank. Next Steps The St. Louis Area Food Bank Partners distributed nearly 1 million pounds of CSFP product to Illinois neighbors in fiscal year 23. That's 904,274 pounds. Thank you for all you do. Congratulations! You've completed your annual Illinois CSFP training. Each program document we talked about is linked to the course page for your convenience. You'll find links to the Civil Rights course, forms, posters, the CSFP manual and contact information. Get your questions answered. Please follow the link provided to document your course completion. Thank you for partnering with us. This course was brought to you by an AmeriCorps service member.